David Livingston Smith is professor of philosophy at the University of New England. He has published 10 books, including Less Than Human, Why We Demean, Enslave, and Exterminate Others, which won the 2012 Ansfield Wolf Award for nonfiction. David's most recent book, Making Monsters, The Uncanny Power of Dehumanization, was a finalist for the 2023 Naif al Rodin Prize for Interdisciplinary Philosophy and was awarded the 2023 Joseph B. Gittler Award from the American Philosophical Association. David has recently been described in the Times Literary Supplement as a, quote, philosopher seeking not just to interpret the world, but to change it. His book on humanity is praised by Harvard University philosopher Cornel West as, quote, a philosophically sophisticated and prophetically courageous treatment of dehumanization, especially in regard to race, and by Yale historian Timothy Snyder as, quote, firm but gentle, wise but accessible. David is an interdisciplinary scholar whose publications are cited not only by other philosophers, but also by historians, legal scholars, psychologists, and anthropologists. He has been featured in several primetime television documentaries, is often interviewed and cited in the national and international media, and was a guest at the 2012 G20 Economic Summit, where he spoke about dehumanization and mass violence. I have the honor and the pleasure of speaking with Dr. David Livingstone Smith today. David, thanks for joining me on the couch. I see you too. <laughs> well, David, I am very happy that you decided to join. I'm even more happy that you agreed to have a conversation with me about Freud. He's someone I've, like many psychologists, have had a I guess a love-hate relationship throughout my career. Admittedly, I'm not a historian of psychology, nor do I pretend to be one. I imagine I've given short shrift to Freud. Actually, I've never met a philosopher who seemed to like him. Reading your substack, clearly you have respect, maybe even an affinity for Freud. So I'm oh, excited to, to hear what you have to say today. You'd be surprised. A lot of the philosophers who like uh, Freud are closeted. Ah. They're, they're not public about it, but they will over a drink. That, ma that makes sense. So Dr. David Livingston Smith, David, again, thanks for agreeing to take the seat on the metaphorical couch today. Before we get started, I thought we might begin with an explanation of how and why I asked you to sit down with me today. Dr. David Livingston Smith has an extensive background, both personally and professionally. I know him as an academic, a philosopher, actually which is why I asked him to join me today. Those new to your work will probably expect a conversation today about dehumanization, evil, authoritarianism. After all, your latest book, Making Monsters, is a real tour de force. And if you haven't gotten your hands on it, I do encourage you to do so. It's a very interesting look at the origins of so-called evil. But admittedly, I came to David's work a little earlier, about 20 years ago, around 2004, if I remember correctly, just uh, piddling around in Walden Books. I stumbled upon an eye-popping little black book with an even more provocative title called Why We Lie, Evolutionary Roots of Deception. Being a uh, new academic psychology professor myself and someone interested, at least as a hobbyist in evolutionary psychology, again, this whet my appetite for more. I read the book and I was thoroughly impressed and started to look into Dr. Livingston Smith's uh, work a little more. He doesn't know this, but I've stayed in uh, sort of contact with his work over the years, and I have become more and more familiar with him. When I originally reached out, my plan was to have him talk about human deception. His response was both surprising and quite exciting for me. He said that it had been a long time since he had done work in this area and thought since my podcast was named Put Him on the Couch, a reference to one of the most storied and perhaps polarizing figures in the history of psychology, why not come on, he said, and have a conversation about the man and the myth himself, Sigmund Freud. So David, who was Sigmund Freud and why do you like him so much? Oh my gosh. Uh, the, the first question is easier to answer than the second. So Sigmund Freud was the creator of a discipline which he called psychoanalysis. And he understood that discipline as consisting of three components. One, a theory of how the mind works. Two, a method of investigation into the mind. And third, and probably least significantly for Freud, a method of psychological treatment. Uh, Freud, I don't know how much detail you want here, but Freud was born in 1856 in what's now the Czech Republic. Uh, his family moved and he was a small child to Vienna. And uh, 
he initially aspired to go into politics. So when he entered the University of Vienna, he um, he wanted to study law, but abruptly changed track because he developed an interest in biology. I thought you were going to say truth. <laughs> <laughs> Both. <laughs> right. True. That, that was a good one. <laughs> um, and uh, so what can I say here? I think perhaps the most important uh, feature of Freud's career to mention at this point is that he eventually became a neurologist and a neuroscientist. So he was part of that very, very exciting era in the late 19th century. Yes. When neuroscientists and linguists and psychologists and psychiatrists were all kind of working in an interdisciplinary net nexus yes. to figure out the nature of the human mind and mental disorder. Uh, Freud invented, he first used the term psychoanalysis in 1896. Mm -hmm. And over the decades, wrote profusely. I mean, this was after his neuroscientific career, and there are four volumes of his strictly neuroscientific publications. Wow. Then 24 volumes of his psychological or psychoanalytic publications. Uh, Freud, in 1939, just before his death, he had been suffering from cancer of the palate for 20 years. He fled Austria after it was annexed by the Nazis. And of course, he was in great danger being both a Jewish man and someone whose ideas and books and thought the Nazis regarded as corrupting. Zerzetzen is the term they like to use. Uh, so he manages to get out of Vienna and go to London, where he died on September 23rd, uh, 1939. Yes, my so, birthday, September 23rd. Oh, really? Yes, it oh. is. <laughs> and I believe there's a significance, David, correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, May 6th, is that a uh, death, uh, is that a, excuse me, is that his um, birth date? That is my brother's yeah. birthday. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Oh, this is spooky. Yeah, a little superstitious, but you know, Freud, I think, would appreciate the symbolism in, in some of this, right? Mm -hmm. So, David, um, thanks for that. What is it about Freud that you find so attractive, at least in terms of your own intellectual pursuits? I think Freud was a really great thinker. Uh, he had what his main critic, a man named Adolf Grumbaum, a philosopher of science, referred to as a brilliant theoretical imagination. So working with very little initially, uh, Freud developed ideas um, which were quite prescient. They were quite philosophically sophisticated and psychologically sophisticated. So I think there's a lot to be mined still in Freud. And a lot of people, you know, as a psychologist, if you mention the name Freud to psychologists, it's like a red flag to a bull. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that's unfortunate. And many, by no means all, but many of the people who despise Freud as some sort of a relic of a pre-scientific past, mm. haven't really bothered to explore his work uh, through primary or even sophisticated secondary sources. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, their knowledge is sort of limited to the, the token three pages in the personality textbook yes. that has to mention Freud, but I can tell you it's amazing how many errors can be squeezed into to three pages. Most remarkable. Yes. Uh, yes. So I think Freud has a lot to offer, uh, both in the questions that he asks and often in the answers that he gives to those questions, which are often, I think, mistaken. But they're not mistaken for stupid reasons. Mm -hmm. You could say his, his mistakes are good mistakes. Okay. 
I also loved Freud as a writer. If you read Freud, you have a sense, even in the English translation, of a rather intimate heart-to-heart -heart conversation with someone. So I, I find that very satisfying and very thrilling. And many Freudian ideas are ideas which are in the background of my more recent work on dehumanization and related topics. My understanding of Freud has greatly enriched uh, my academic productivity and intellectual life. And finally, I think there's a great deal to be said for certain aspects of the forms of psychotherapy that Freud initiated. So there's that dimension too. Yeah, sure. David, who do you think were Freud's most important influences intellectually? That, that's, a, that's a difficult, I think a lot of people get this wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, Nietzsche. Yeah. But that's probably not true. Mm -hmm. uh, Freud had actually two sets of Nietzsche's collected works, but there's no evidence that he really read them. Oh. <laughs> and when I say that... Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and me. My bookshelf is full of books sure. that I haven't. Um, uh, so in Freud's correspondence, which is very extensive, he's often talking about the books he's reading. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really mention Nietzsche, I believe, until the 1920s, where he's already an old man. Mm. Um, so the influence of Nietzsche would be indirect. I mean, it was in the air in in Ger uh, German language intellectual circles mm -hmm. during the period that Freud was in university and in the early part of his career. Uh, the philosopher Kant is actually far more influential. We know that because in the Freud Museum, which is Freud's home in London, we have a copy of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason that Freud owned, and it is extensively annotated wow. in the margins. So there was Kant, and there were a whole host of neuroscientists um, and the people, I would say scientists of the mind, because psychology hadn't really formed as a discipline in those early days, that Freud was greatly in, indebted to. People like Hel Helmholtz and yes. Fetner, um, who really um, pioneered the scientific study of the human mind. So yeah. there are many, yeah. many, many people in that, uh, with that background. Sure. Who is the, the young Freud. Well, anyone who's heard of Freud, no doubt heard references to his peculiar lexicon, his academic lexicon. Uh, words like conscious or unconscious come to mind. There are many others, but I would just wonder if you could remark, if you would, on the distinction, if there is one, between conscious and unconscious as far as Freud was concerned. Well, I think we need to start in a slightly different place. Okay. That's the distinction between unconscious and subconscious. Okay. Often people talk about Freud as um, describing and studying the subconscious, but this was a term that he specifically avoided. And he specifically avoided it because it had a, a, um, a certain technical meaning uh, among scientists of the mind in the late 19th century. So I want to go back a few centuries and start with a man who had a vast influence on psychology, uh, who, and that was René Descartes. Mm. The writing in the, in the uh, 17th century, Descartes made a number of claims about the human mind. One was that the mind is something that's not physical. Uh, so we have physical bodies and it's kind of spooky, non-physical minds, and these two entities interact. So perception is to be explained by the physical body, the processing of visual information, and sort of transmission, as it were, by Wi-Fi, to use an anachronism, uh, to the non-physical mind, which then has the experience of perception. And similarly, voluntary action 
takes the opposite route. The non-physical mind makes a distinction, sends a message to the body that pulls these little levers in the brain that redirects what he thought was nervous fluid. Yes. People have no idea of how the nerves work right. and causes the body to move. Now, um, this was deeply influential. The other aspect of Descartes' thinking, which was deeply influential, was his equating of mind with consciousness. In yeah. other words, it's the idea that if something is in our mind, we know it automatically. We can introspect it. The yes. mind is like a fishbowl, and you just have to look into the fishbowl and you see the fish. So this was really influential right up to the beginnings of psychology as a um, scientific discipline. So if you look at some of the first experimental psychologists, people like Wilhelm Wundt, for instance, they were introspectionists. Yes. Their yes. whole procedure was to train experimental subjects to be uh, to introspect accurately, expose them to stimuli, get their reports, and so on. And as psychological laboratories sprung up in the late 19th century, uh, the idea was, I think, to emulate the chemists who had discovered the basic components of matter, the elements. And these guys wanted to discover the basic, the atoms of consciousness. Yeah, the periodic as, table of the mind, I guess. Exactly. And it was a disaster because the results were predictably very inconsistent. That, by the way, led to two psychological movements, which in their early writings are strikingly similar which rejected the Cartesian view. One was behaviorism with Watson, and the other was psychoanalysis with Freud. Watson says, well, let's ignore the mind entirely. This is treacherous water. Look what happened to the introspectionists. We're going to go in a different direction. Freud said, let's distrust the reports of consciousness, not the mind, but consciousness, oh which really God. is a precursor to some aspects of cognitive science later in the in the 20th century. Absolutely. Okay. So we have this Cartesian framework. The mind is transparent to itself. You can't be mistaken about what goes in, on in your mind, and body and mind are separate. During the 19th century, this view came under a lot of pressure. It came under pressure from physics. The physicists demonstrated that if Descartes' position was correct, then the principle of the conservation of energy was incorrect, right? Because energy would have to be being injected yeah. into the physical universe from some spooky realm. That's right. Okay. Um, it, well, it came under pressure from biology with Darwin, mm. but it also came under pressure through the development of neuroscience, mm -hmm. and in particular, experiments in hypnosis. Okay. So neuroscientists were demonstrating, beginning with Broca in the middle of the 19th century, that the poster child for Descartes' view of the mind, which is language, was at the very least intimately associated with a particular region of the brain. Mm -hmm. So he kicks off the discipline of aphasiology, the study of uh, language disorders that are caused by brain damage. Freud's chief, um, this is an aside, but his reputation as a neuroscientist is largely based on two things. One was he was an aphasiologist. He wrote a very influential book on aphasia, really good book. Uh, which was in use well into the 20th century. And also, um, he was an expert on cerebral palsy, what's called cerebral palsy now, just by the way, in childhood. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what was going on there? Well, I explained about uh, the development of the physiology, and that calls Descartes' view into question. They were also studying rather bizarre and exotic uh, neurological disorders. Um, so hemi neglect, where you don't experience part of your body as your body, uh, visual agnosia, where you think your 
blind, but you're not. Yes. Um, and so on. And these just didn't fit in well <laughs> with the Cartesian framework. Now, hypnosis no. was even more dramatic because it demonstrated that one can have ideas which influence behavior of which one is utterly unaware. Oh, the hidden observer that Hilgard refers to. Yes, yes, that's right. Okay. So that 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 one was really problematic. And a lot of people pioneering the study of the mind were trying to square, particularly the results of hypnosis and some psychopathological phenomena with the Cartesian view. So remember, Descartes says, if it's mental, it's conscious. By definition, mm. this is the world that Freud is coming into. And some people say, well, okay, so if we're looking at hypnosis, maybe these aren't really unconscious ideas because that would violate the principle. They're just neurological states which under normal circumstances would produce mental states. Um, well, uh, that's I call that dispositionalism, the idea that these people have a disposition to be in these mental states, but they don't, they're not really in it. That's kind of a weird view. Uh, the other was uh, invoking the idea of disassociation. Mm -hmm. So these folks, and this was most popular in psychiatry, we're saying things like, well, uh, yeah, these are mental states, but they're not really unconscious. What's going on is that the mind kind of can split apart like an amoeba with a main consciousness and one or more, and here's the term, subconsciousnesses. Ah. So that term was linked to this view. In his early work, Freud flirted with both those. His, his thinking was fairly conventional. And then in 1895, during the course of writing a paper which was never published in his lifetime, but which is astonishingly Britain, brilliant, I'm sorry, published in the 1950s, where he is articulating a speculative neuropsychological model. It's called Sci uh, Project for Scientific Psychology. And I emphasize speculative because these folks had no tools to work with, no, right? That's right. You're someone that demonstrates kind of weird behavior, and then you had to wait till they die yeah. and see if you could see anything in their brains. That's like trying to understand how a computer works, being able only to study broken computers. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's amazing what they did with those meager resources. Okay, so 1895, Freud suddenly jettisons all of this Cartesian baggage. He says, well, I think we should look at the mind as something physical. We should look at the mind as the brain, as identical to the functioning of the brain. Okay. All right. And if we accept that, then we should also distrust the results of introspection. Sure. As giving a complete account of psychological uh, processes and contents, right? Mm -hmm. After all, we can't um, introspect our neural activation vectors, right? right. That, we can't do that. That's what's going on between our ears. And so this was a very radical move, and it's often misunderstood. So historians of psychology often say, well, Freud was a materialist. He believed the mind equals the brain, and he got this from his teachers. Mm -hmm. They were mostly, if you read them carefully, dualists yes. of one or another. So that in itself, I think, is worthy of making Freud a very significant figure in the history, both of philosophy and, and in psychology. But he got even more radical than this as he developed his ideas. So as I said, this, this paper was, was not published in Freud's lifetime. And the reason it wasn't is that Freud was aware that Neuroscience simply did not have the resources to do what he wanted to do. And that's why he moves to psychology in a somewhat embarrassed manner. Mm. It's like, um, you know, he, I think he was worried he was leaving real science behind. Wow. But it was necessary if he was 
going to form some theoretical estimation of, of how the mind works. So where he gets to is this, and then I'll shut up a little bit. No, that's fine. Freud button and <laughs> it all comes up. I uh, know. So we love it. Um, you know, psychologists today, nowadays, after the demise of behaviorism, as, as the leading paradigm in psychology, psychologists are fond of saying, yeah, we talk about the unconscious, but it's really different from Freud's. Mm. It's the cognitive unconscious. Well, the news is that Freud's unconscious was cognitive. How about that? Yeah. He, in fact, Freud did not believe that emotions could be unconscious. I'll clarify that in a minute. Mm -hmm. He's very explicit about this. And it just shows you the degree to which psychologists often don't bother to acquaint themselves yeah. with Freud's views before pronouncing. Um, yeah, it's, and maybe it's less about being about misunderstanding and and more about just plain ignorance. And they didn't ignorance. do the work, didn't put in the work. Yes, exactly. Right. Now that's right. It, it's plain ignorance. Um, so uh, Freud came to the view initially in 1895. And then in, in print in uh, 1899, with the publication of the interpretation of dreams, um, that all cognition is unconscious. It's an extraordinarily radical view. Yes. And in fact, we'd say all and all cognition is unconscious and only cognitive processes are intrinsically unconscious. Okay. So Freud sees consciousness as kind of a, a display, a selective display of the outputs of these complex cognitive processes going on unconsciously. Oh, like the icons of a smartphone versus what's going on behind the exactly. scenes. This, like sound, the, this sounds like the, um, that user interface theory, the cognitive scientist uh, Daniel exactly. Hoffman. Daniel Hoffman has yes, been promoting. That's, that's yeah, basically it. Yeah. So Freud was talking about this way before these guys and way before any anyway. uh, these cognitive uh, visualist guys. I, just by the way, while we're on this this topic, um, Freud also uh, in 1895 proposed a theory of learning that involved the modification of the weights between uh, neurons which decades later became known as Hebbian learning. Yes, Donald Hebb. Kind of rediscovered. And to just one more I'd like to show off. The, um, the learning algorithm used in, in uh, connectionist networks was also pioneered by Ford in 1895. And if, if any of your listeners doubt this, uh, I would suggest they look up a book called The Roots of Backpropagation. That's the name yes. of the learning algorithm. Okay. Uh, sorry, algorithm mm -hmm. by a man named Paul Werbos. It was his uh, PhD thesis at MIT. And he explicitly says that he derived this from Freud's 1895 text. Wow. All right. So again, many reasons. You can disagree with all of the rest of Freud mm -hmm. and still remark on his significance for cognitive science and psychology just on the basis of what happened in 1895. Wow. His, his... Yeah, well, I knew he was, he was definitely coming of age at a time when lots of amazing discoveries were happening, both in and yeah. outside of neuroscience. You know, I think about the debate about the reticular um, view of the neuron versus the more connected yes. neuron doctrine, right? And Yes. I'm, I'm assuming Freud had a hand in that as well. He had something to say about that, I believe. I think he was on yes. the side of the neuron doctrine, actually, which turned he out was. to be correct, yeah. And I, and I think it was a little bit before, um, what's the fellow's name, the Spanish name? Oh, Cajal, Ramon y Cajal. Yeah, Cajal. Yeah, yeah, a little bit before Cajal's mm -hmm. momentous um, presentation of the idea that neurons are separated by synapses yeah the spaces Freud there. talked about what he called contact barriers mm. between so it wasn't quite exactly yeah he's getting there but he was getting there yeah yeah um 
Yeah, it, it, it seems to me that many of my um, contemporaries have always believed that Freud moved away from neurology because he wasn't smart enough, that he was trying <laughs> to hide his narcissism in psychology. But, you know, yeah. to hear you describe Freud and the, um, the almost love affair he had with, with the human body, the brain, yes. um, it, it paints a much more complex picture of who Freud was, doesn't it? Oh, yes, yes. And, and we, can, we can take that a little bit further. Freud... I think it's it's correct to say reluctantly left neuroscience behind simply because the tools were too primitive. So if we're wanting to do science and human behavior in 1895 or even 1920 or even later, with, yes. by the time of Freud's death in 39, we're better off with psychology than with, with neuroscience. Wow, isn't that something? Yeah, I mean, yeah. the psychophysicists were doing, you know, lots of interesting things, and they had some uh, interesting tools, but yeah, I guess you're right. Neuroscience didn't really have all of these wonderful tools, right? Certainly didn't so have was, anything resembling an MRI machine. Exactly. So it was, it was neuropsychology was highly speculative, and mm -hmm. that's not to dismiss it. I think these people, these pioneers were just utterly brilliant. Mm -hmm. So Freud realizes, I'm going to have to take a different path to pursue my my project. He consistently thought throughout his life, or he consistently hoped mm -hmm. that one day all of the stuff that he described using psychological terminology could be described more accurately using strictly neuroscientific terminology. Okay. In other words, he hoped that a lot of psychology would one day be replaced by neuroscience. Yeah. In 1908, he said, you know, we're nowhere near this. This was at a meeting of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. I expect it'll be on the agenda a century from now, which is well, not, not far not, off. Not far off, is it? No, yeah. there have been, been many. I mean, I would argue that a large percentage of what used to be thought of as purely, you know, psychological disorders are now fall squarely on the umbrella of medicine, right? Neurology in particular. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think he was far off at all. Yeah. So why the language, David? Uh, why why the strange sounding words, the id, the ego, the superego? Was it he just couldn't shake um, his paying homage to literature or to? Um... Well, let me tell you that the terms id, ego, and superego are not Freud's terms. Mm -hmm. They were introduced by his translator. Okay. They're Latin words. Uh, and And Freud would definitely have objected <laughs> to that. Uh, as he says quite explicitly, I'm writing for people who are intelligent, but not necessarily well-educated. Therefore, okay. I avoid Greek and Latin terms. How about that? So, so Freud wrote largely in vernacular German. I see. Um, okay. And so a lot of the terminology of psychoanalysis, as we understand it in the English-speaking world, is an artifact of translations by people, I think, that perhaps are slightly embarrassed that it doesn't sound scientific enough. Mm -hmm. So id, ego, and superego, uh, id in Freud's term was das S, which means it, the it. Mm -hmm. And the ego, ego was, of course, Latin. Freud's term was das ich, the I. And superego was über ich, the over of I, or the above I. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of language that is easy to understand in the German, but a little bit intimidating in the English. I see. So we know he was a great thinker. He dabbled in a lot of different disciplines. Why the affinity for therapy? What, what got him so interested in what we might call clinical psychology or neuropsychology today? Mm -hmm. uh, when did that yeah. start and... and what was he hoping to achieve there? So Freud made a living. Well, let me go back a little mm -hmm. bit. So I told you he was really interested in biology, yes. particularly the biology of the nervous system. He did some uh, neurohistology, developing stains for uh, for neurons. Mm 
Uh, he, he was interested in the Darwinian controversy, as it was called back then, the evolution of the nervous system, uh, studying invertebrates initially. But his prospects weren't really great in that field. One reason was the rise in political anti-Semitism in the late 19th century in the German-speaking world particularly after the stock market crash of 1873, which was blamed on Jews. Sure. Uh, so he was advised, hey, why don't you go into medicine? He wasn't particularly interested in being a doctor. In fact, he once said, I'm not sadistic enough to be a doctor. Oh, wow. <laughs> dentist, <laughs> he was I, very, a dentist, I can see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he was very humorous. <laughs> His background wasn't varied enough for him to become a general practitioner. Hmm. So he decided to become a neurologist, a clinical neurologist, worked his way through various departments in Vienna General Hospital, got his qualification, opened his practice in 1886. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a funny story about this, which was never published to my knowledge, but I've learned about it through Freud Scholar Networks. Okay. So when Freud opened his practice, he got his five sisters to sit in the waiting room. The <laughs> they idea were plants. Of, yeah, they were plants. So people coming by would say, whoa, he's a successful neurologist. Yes. He's got all these patients. We ought to sign up with him. So Donald Trump did read Freud. I see. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. yeah. That is so, too much. Uh, That's great. So, and uh, Many people who were coming to neurologists in those days, psychotherapy was not a profession. Mm -hmm. We're suffering from what were believed to be psychological disorders, mm -hmm. many of which are considered psychological disorders today. In 1886, no one knew what to do. Right. There were weird and wonderful treatments for uh, what was called hysteria, which is sort of a catch-all category of of a psychological disorder. Yes. Which has been divided up into different categories in contemporary psychiatry. Yes. yes. Um, they would uh, put them on special diets or make them use hydrotherapy, you know, um, spray them with cold water. Bring about the uh, cataclysmic paroxysms, I guess the the invention of the vibrator, right, Darewimple, or. <laughs> All this kind of weird stuff. Yes. Of necessity, then, given his professional pathway, Freud was confronted with the need to treat people very early on in his career. I think if we look at the trajectory of his career, um, this was always really intellectually for him secondary. He was mm -hmm. first and foremost a theorist of the mind and how the mind works. In fact, late in life, he said, you know, I don't know if psychoanalysis is really very helpful at all to mm -hmm. people who are suffering psychologically. And just by the way, he didn't think uh, psychotherapy of any sort would be helpful for people with psychotic disorders. Okay. He pinned, okay. His, he pinned his hopes on psychopharmacology. And this oh, was wow. really in the early days. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So yep. he came to make a living doing psychotherapy, but it, it wasn't the center of gravity for him. Yeah, that makes sense. It reminds me of a, an ex-girlfriend I had. She was oftentimes made to feel less than because she had a traditional studio art background, but mm -hmm. she had taken up work as a scientific illustrator. Oh. And people would ask, uh, you know, what is your background? She'd say, oh, art... Oh, what did you study? Uh, oil, pastels, and where do you work? Oh, I illustrate, you know, uh, academic, yes. um, oh. academic renderings. I create academic renderings for for publication. They're like, what? So I guess Freud, yeah, he was just trying to pay the bills, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, you got to do what you you got to do. And he I, did pra he did have his own it. practice where he lived as well, right? Upstairs, he yeah. I guess lived upstairs or practiced upstairs. Yeah, well, he he lived for almost all of his life in an apartment mm -hmm. in Vienna, mm -hmm. uh, which is now the Viennese Freud Museum. There, yes. There's the London one and, right. the, and the Vienna one. 
Uh, and he practiced from his apartment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And a real workaholic, as I understand it. I mean, he put oh, in, my God. He put in the so hours. Sleep. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote until late, late, late at night. How about that? Yes. 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 So <clears throat> shouldn't throw... Freud away just yet. That's what you're saying. I could, I can feel pretty comfortable putting him back on the syllabus, maybe even expanding yeah. the syllabus a little bit, maybe beyond just that little paragraph we, we pay mm -hmm. to him in the beginning of psychology when we talk about the history or the two pages yeah. we might paint the personality chapter with, with him with. Yes, definitely. I encourage that. David, as we end here, and I want to thank you again for spending so much time with me today. This has been fascinating. And it's also been educational for me. I know my listeners are going to be very happy to hear that um, Freud is still relevant today. And before I let you go, I want to ask you one final big question and then maybe give you some student rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the, the last big question I guess I have is what would you say is Freud's most significant contribution to mankind? What is, what is the thing that, that you would say is more than anything else, his legacy? I'll, get, I'll answer in two ways. Okay. First, very definitely, uh, as the pioneer of unconscious mental processing, he was there before a lot of people got there, and very uncompromisingly. Second, and you, you won't find this, at least won't find it very often in the literature on Freud, but it's certainly the case. He showed us that we're all crazy in our own way. Mm. That there's not a huge gap between what we call normal, which yeah. is largely a sham, mm -hmm. and what we call Abnormal. psychopathological. You know, it's just some people have difficulty adapting their madness to the world, mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of us, some of us are better able to conceal it. And I think that's a very, very, very important message. Actually, let me let me add a third one. Okay. Sex drives people nuts. <laughs> he definitely knew this. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So those are those are three of I think very. Let me add a fourth, and then I'll stop because okay. I could go okay. on. Yeah, yeah. The fourth is children have complex mental lives. Mm. There's a lot going on in them. Yeah, they're not blank slates. They are not. They are not. No, they're not. They they. They have all sorts of concerns and mm -hmm. all sorts of anxieties uh, and so on. Yeah. So, like I said, I could go on for an hour on the Freud's, I think, very important contributions, but I'll, I'll stop yeah. there. I think that's important. And I noticed you didn't, you didn't even mention the defense mechanisms, which is the only thing most psych professors mention when you say, well, is there anything redeeming about Freud? Anything <laughs> that he was right about? And they're like, well, maybe this sort of notion of, uh, an unconscious and definitely the defense mechanisms. Okay. Yeah. And they very often get the defense mechanisms wrong, by the way. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's not the way. Uh, so here are some student um, questions and I'm sure you can imagine what many of them are going to be. I think some of them were quite, quite learned. First of okay. all, I'll, I'll give you an easy one first. Was Freud a mind body dualist or would you consider him more of a monist? I think you've already answered that question. Yeah, he was, he was uh, more than a monist. He was yeah. a he was a materialist. Yeah, certainly uh, not to do it. Uh, did Freud have a relationship with Salvador Dali? Uh, they met once. Okay. Dali visited him in London. Freud didn't have much of an appreciation for surrealism. I see. As he um, my students that are spending too much of their time on TikTok have come across some real Freud haters lately, David, and they mm -hmm. want to know if. By today's standards, would you consider Freud a narcissist and a misogynist? <laughs> I would certainly not consider him a misogynist. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why. Many of his closest uh, confederates in the psychoanalytic movement mm -hmm. were women. Mm -hmm. When the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society wanted to exclude women, Freud objected to it. He also objected when they wanted to exclude gay people, just oh, wow. by the way. Okay. Um, this is like really early 20th century, what we're talking about. Uh, when psychoanalysts were fleeing Europe in the wake of Nazism, and many of, many of them were coming to the United States, somewhere between a quarter and a third were women. Mm. 
In the United States, there was nothing like that. Yeah. In the United States, if you want to talk about misogyny and medicalization, Freud yeah. didn't believe psychoanalysis should be medicalized, by mm -hmm. the way. It was heavily male dominated. Yes. So no, I I I I I don't think that's a sufficiently nuanced characterization of Freud's mm -hmm. attitude towards towards women. Um did Freud say or in any way allude to humans only using 10% of their brains? And uh, no. no <laughs> so we, we can't attribute that myth to Freud. No. In fact, I'm guessing that was one of the things Freud wouldn't have been able to substantiate without the help of some kind of uh, neurophysiological exactly. equipment, right? Yes. Um, there's a couple of others, I'm sure. Let's see. I, and I think he probably would have objected to it on purely biological grounds. Sure. Uh, he only used 10%. Why is the why is the other ninety percent there? Absolutely right? right. Or as a professor once said to me, you know, can you imagine a correspondence of yours being being stabbed or shot in the head, and you race down to the um, ER and you're asking about your friend, you want an update, and the physician comes out and says, "Don't worry, it hit him in the ninety percent he doesn't use." Yeah, yeah, right. Did Freud have a close or? special relationship with his mom. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He was a good Jewish son. Okay. But nothing weird or enmeshed or anything that would... No, not to my knowledge. Okay. I mean, of course, these sorts of things are difficult mm -hmm. to determine. I don't think there's any reason to, to assume so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And did he indeed die of cancer of the throat from smoking too many cigars? It was cancer of the palate, okay. not the throat. It was undoubtedly caused by his cigar addiction. Okay. He became addicted to cigars to get himself off cocaine. How about that? Well, that was going to be my last question. Did Freud become addicted to the cocaine that he so enthusiastically prescribed to others? <laughs> I don't know if he was addicted to it. He mm -hmm. certainly used it. I, I believe I may be mistaken for about 10 years. Okay. Uh, he thought that cocaine was God's gift to mankind mm -hmm. um, as a treatment for uh, depression and anxiety when he had to go into some kind of, you know, he was a guy from a working class background. Sure. If he had to go to some fancy do, of course, he would feel anxious. He snort a little cocaine. Yeah, that, to that, get would, that would get him right. right. Yeah. Take the edge yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he missed the, the one medical use of cocaine, which is an anesthetic that, for the eye. Well, David, anything fun you're working on um, in the future that my audience should know about? Well, I have a kind of vague plan to mm -hmm. do a book about Freud for oh, popular art. Fantastic. Subtitled Lessons on Being Human from okay. Sigmund Freud. Okay. Uh, but more immediately, uh, my spouse and I are planning, hoping, we should hear from the publisher this week, to co-author a book on race. Oh, fantastic! My spouse is also a philosopher, okay, and she's of she's of Jamaican origin, so we have a, a contrasting color scheme yeah. between us, and we're both race skeptics. We, sure. we both deny that race corresponds to anything real, mm -hmm. but go further than that and argue that it's actually an evil and destructive yes. notion. Yes, publishers have been a little bit scared of taking this on. I bet also possible blowback. On yeah. But I can't think of many things more important to talk about now than that, David. Well, David, again, so thankful for your time. I appreciate you. And i uh, got to get you down here to Wilmington sometime. And, and do tell your spouse, I do look forward to reaching out to her and maybe coordinating something where she can come on and, and talk with a, an evolutionary psychologist sometime. Yeah, yeah. You, she's, she's pretty formative. You, yeah. I think you'll enjoy the conversation. I look forward to it. It'd be fun. Again, okay. been talking with Dr. David Livingstone. And uh, David, I do appreciate your time. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Bye. -bye. Bye.